I found myself in a magical garden. It was like a fairy tale or a scene from Alice. Now you can start. Seven artists and their friends were celebrating Peter Blake's 45th birthday in an old-fashioned tea garden near Bath. <laughs> they seemed a happy family, and they called themselves the Brotherhood of Ruralists. Peter Blake, who's now cast in the role of the group Godfather, or Chairman, had been one of the leaders of the English pop art scene when he was at the Royal College of Art. Graham Ovenden, now in his mid-thirties, belonged to the next generation at the college. Blake was his teacher. Annie Ovenden comes from Buckinghamshire. She is the youngest of the group and studied at High Wycombe. Jan Howarth, Peter Blake's wife, was born in Hollywood. After studying in California, she came to England to work at the Slade School of Art in London. Graham Arnold, was born in Beckenham in Kent. His father published religious books and was a spare time painter. Graham studied at the Royal College, then taught in the Royal Academy schools. His wife, Anne Arnold, studied at Epsom in Surrey and after that practiced art therapy with children for 10 years. Oh, you go, you want to hand it round? I'll have it for in a minute. David Inshaw came from Staffordshire, first to Beckenham and then to the academy schools, where he was one of Graham Arnold's pupils. <laughs> Peter and Jan completed the circle by introducing the Arnolds to the Ovendons, and so in 1975, the Brotherhood was formed. I was reminded of those gatherings of artists and models in the forests of Barbizon during the 19th century, and of all those impressionist picnics along the banks of the Seine. Was history repeating itself? We photographed the first ruralist exhibition as it was being hung in the Festival Gallery in Bath early in the summer of 77. What had it been like, I wondered, when the Impressionists hung their first show in 1874, or when that other brotherhood, the Pre-Raphaelites, first met in 1848? Will these stills become collector's items in some photo archive of British painting? Should I send them to the Tate Gallery? What was it all about? We are taking a tiny aspect of art and painting round that, Peter Blake told me. It would be nice, Jan Howarth said, to make a statement collectively. We are mighty dissatisfied with the way painting has been going for a number of years, declared Graham Ovenden. We are all different, said David Inshaw, but we fit together like the pieces of a jigsaw. Graham Arnold agreed. Anne Arnold and Annie Ovenden felt that being part of the group kept them painting as well as playing their part in family life. As I got to know them better, they began to talk more about their work. It struck me that not one of them would be the least ashamed to talk about painting as though it were a kind of magic. Jan Howarth had been making some beautiful and highly original masks. Peter Blake was showing paintings based on Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. The calm of an English summer could hardly be better expressed than by David Inshaw's The Cricket Match. Graham Arnold exhibited mysterious collages. This one was called Jacqueline and His Dream of Flying. Graham Ovenden showed some beautiful visionary interpretations of English landscape. Annie Ovenden paints landscapes too. The Cornfield was by Anne Arnold. The ruralists talk about the spirit of the country in which they've grown up. They talk about the Pre-Raphaelites as well. The Pre-Raphaelites have been called the English Dreamers. During this first summer of the New Brotherhood, I wanted to learn about their dreams. I wanted to know what they were thinking and doing at this point in their lives. 
The Blakes live in Somerset, in what was once Wellow Village Railway Station. The Arnolds live 20 miles away in Wiltshire. Their home is in Devizes, and every day they walk through the churchyard to a row of tiny cottages, one of which they use as their studio. Inshaw's home is next to the Arnolds, and his studio overlooks a walled garden. David is a keen photographer, a cricket enthusiast. He doesn't like being called the only bachelor in the group. He was just coming to the end of a two-year fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge, and was beginning to miss the comforts and the conveniences of college life. In a remote valley in Cornwall, Graham Ovenden bought a cottage, a stream and a forest. He is the most uncompromising of all, and by his own labour and design is turning this cottage into a granite castle fit for a king, with towers, spires, and medieval hall. Back in Somerset, at Wellow, John Howarth, as well as being an artist, runs a small school for a dozen children or so. She calls it the Looking Glass School. During the summer, she often took the children across the valley for picnics. And Peter Blake, with his daughter Daisy, would join them on the hillside. Careful, because there's a little stream. I don't want to go in the tree. Comes down Come here. on, stop. Whoa. Yeah, this is a little tight here. <laughs> David Inshaw and the Arnolds love walking on the hills above the Vale of Pusey and down into the valley below. They often go on sketching expeditions along the banks of the Kennedaven Canal, a kind of picture poaching, well suited to other traditional country pastimes. They talk about being in touch with English tradition, as represented by Thomas Hardy, Shakespeare, Stanley Spencer. Their heroes are Millet, Holman Hunt, Samuel Palmer. They describe their work as a celebration through their personal vision of a native legacy that has been overlooked for many years. Some people may think that all this celebration of nature is pretty old-fashioned stuff, that the whole idea is romantic, sentimental, nostalgic. The Brotherhood use such words with strong approval. They see nothing escapist in what they are doing. They claim this landscape as their birthright. They fear that it may be threatened by urban life, and they want to see it survive for reasons that are not just sentimental. For Jan Howarth, coming from California, the English countryside was a revelation. The things that I was most aware of, and particularly I was acutely aware of when I first came here, uh, because I came from outside and because I, I saw things as if they were um, sort of absolutely new, like being a newborn baby, but in this, but being an adult in this country, um, were things like, I mean, just the fabulous greenery of the country, which was so, uh, just compelling, you know, just so wonderful, um, especially for me coming from a desert, you know, I mean, it, uh, it was amazing that grass could grow without sprinklers, you know, and, uh, and it was a complete dream for me as a child. I always would, always fantasize about running through a field knee-deep in grass. And I never ever got over it. I mean, I just could never find that. It never existed, you know. So um, that this lushness in England, which I, I, I must alter one's temperament. I, I'm sure that the, that the countryside does actually change your temperament. And I'm sure a lot of people understand who live in the country that this is so. Because last summer, when everybody kind of became Italians, <laughs> I, you were different. I, I only, only once ever took a train from Cambridge to London. But I, I was depressed beyond belief to see that there wasn't very much countryside between the two. Perhaps for ten minutes after leaving Cambridge there were a few fields, but one soon entered a kind of endless housing estate, which seemed to go on and on and on, an endless new box-type building. And 
no matter where you go in England, no matter which big city you travel into, it's like that. If I am in a big city, a very noisy big city, I tend to cut off all my senses, which normally I enjoy very much, the being a painter. You're always using your eyes, and you're always looking at things, you're always gazing at things, and, uh, and, listen, and also the other senses. And in the town, you get overwhelmed. I do, I get completely overwhelmed. We've become very, very dependent on um, the apparatus of uh, you know, washing machines and, and things like that, which uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't sling out because it gives you time. But uh, the thing is that mentally, you certainly can s sort of uh, re-evaluate the fact that, I, well, I mean, you know, I grew up and we didn't, I mean, my mother and I both laugh at it now. Um, it was ridiculous to us that we should shell peas or anything like that. I mean, why waste that time? We've become so kind of time conscious, particularly in California and America, that these things that suddenly you discover, you know, a fresh egg is really amazing or, or peas are, are fantastic and the pleasure that can be uh, got from something that is um, is simply fresh food or, or, you know, a lovely garden or something like that. I mean, you, you, you forget that kind of thing when you go faster and faster. 40, 30. The summer took its course. The Brotherhood's exhibition made its way around galleries in Edinburgh, Doncaster and Southampton. Nothing very sensational happened. If an art revolution was in progress, then no one seemed to notice. Miss May leads by four games to one, second set. Well, we'll just leave uh, the centre court for a few moments to have a look at court number two where John Fever of Great Britain is playing Colin Downswell. There's Fever. Colin Downswell of Rhodesia and Fever's up against it. He's 30-40 down, 3-5 down, final set. This is Fever now. Time flows over Peter Blake like a quiet country stream. Paintings never seem to be finished. They are often shown as works in progress. This portrait of David Hockney had been started 14 years before. He began it during his pop art period. It was now urgently needed by the Arts Council for an exhibition called British Painting 1952 to 1977. It could be said to cover that period pretty well. for Dartswell. Now we've got another result in the men's singles. Tim Gullickson, that's the right-hander from the United States, has beaten Steve Krulovitz of the States 6-2, 6-4, And Jane Stratton has beaten Mrs. Fordyce, who's the former Patty Hogan of the United States, 4-6, 9-7, 6-4. Back to the centre court. Patty May serving, 4-1 in the second set, having won first 6-3. 15, love. All the painters in the Brotherhood are craftsmen. Their work proceeds at an almost medieval pace. It is long considered and carefully prepared. In their tiny studio cottage, the Arnolds paint almost back to back. Graham had been working on a very large painting of a Sussex church for more than two years. During that time, days of work had gone into small details and studies which he had made on the spot. In his studio, his time was spent on achieving very precise effects of colour. In his mind, the subject was associated with a feeling of complete peace. In his mind's eye, he could see the completed painting with the greatest of precision.
patiently, hour by hour, day by day, he was applying his glazes of oil colour and using the smallest sable brushes to achieve his purpose. On this one painting, he'd already worn out 50 brushes. Anne Arnold's paintings are less complicated, but they are also painted with great precision and care. They arise directly from things seen and deeply felt. They are quiet, modest, and utterly unfashionable. For me, they had about them the same sense of inner stillness that I found in her husband's work. They are gentle pictures, quiet observations. You can see through the little window um, in the old wash house there, and you can just see um, people walking towards the church. And one morning I looked through there, and again, it's a place that I love. And I just caught sight of the bride and her father just standing very, very motionless because I didn't realize it, but they were having their photograph taken. But that moment it illuminated the scene and you know, made it that's what I, the moment I want to, to paint in this particular place. Because of the spirit of the place idea is something that I'm very interested in. Down in Cornwall, Graham Ovenden had not yet got round to finishing his studio. He had to paint in the sitting room with his canvases leaning against the piano. This portrait of Peter Blake with his daughter was a study of paternal devotion and also an object of devotion in its own right. Ovenden works with an almost Florentine attention to detail and decoration. He too paints with small sable brushes and he applies the paint with the precision of a miniaturist. He mixes his colours on the back of a palette knife. Technique, without imagination, would count for little. There's a strong element of make-believe, almost eccentricity in the ruralist world. They not only live in beautiful surroundings, they've collected or created about themselves a richly imaginative environment. The Blake's home in the old railway station at Wellow is like an Aladdin's cave. It's a magician's stockroom, a kind of left luggage office, packed with bygone treasures and artefacts. In many ways, it looks like a gigantic doll's house, a place where children and parents share the same toys. Jan Howarth is well known for making life-sized dolls, figures stuffed and stitched into the clothed and padded forms of popular idols. She has created figures with magical multicoloured cloaks and costumes, and this particular summer she was devising a series of tapestry masks. I love the idea of, of the pretense of a mask, and I'm rather interested that our culture isn't producing masks. Needlework, tapestry, dolls, these are all traditional English arts which have often expressed extravagant flights of fancy. My, my particular um, involvement with make-believe generally is, is something that uh, in my work I like to make something that either I can't have because it's impossible, like a maid or something, or a cowboy, uh, a, a rodeo rider or something like that, or something that doesn't exist and I'd like to have it in my environment, you know, sort of, uh, you know, mermaids and uh, uh, little funny creatures and things like that, fairies and stuff. So, uh, you know, a lot of the things I have are sort of fantasy based. One of Jan's most amazing inventions is this Humpty Dumpty, made from an ostrich egg. Lewis Carroll is one of the heroes of the Brotherhood. 
The Alice theme is continued in a number of watercolours by Peter Blake, which he's also reproduced as prints, and even used as a basis for a series of stained glass windows. He plans to put these into an Alice museum, which he is starting in the village barn. Outside, between the railway platforms, the Blakes have built an Alice garden. When Alice comes out of the house, mm -hmm. she walks down into the garden mm -hmm. and she talks to the tiger lilies and the daisies and all the different plants. And in the distance she can see a hill that she'd like to get to and that's that hill there. She tries to get to the hill but no matter how, mu how much she walks mm -hmm. towards the hill she still ends up at that back at the house and that's what happens on those paths. In a minute, you can go down and walk on the paths, and you can see how you can't get to the hill. And eventually, she meets the red... Cross. Further down the line is Jan's school, which is in the station master's house. Do you think it's really from the Queen? Yeah. yeah. It no. says, look, Buckingham Palace on the top. Can you read it? Buckingham, Buckingham Palace. There. Okay, 20th of June, 1977. It isn't from the Queen herself. It's from her lady-in-waiting. To the children of Looking Glass School, I am commanded by the Queen to write and thank you all for the good wishes which you sent to Her Majesty on the occasion of her Silver Jubilee. The Queen was deeply touched that you should remember her at this time. Right. Eight and add seven. And nine, Easy. And nine, Fifteen. And nine. The English schooling system, particularly the primary education, is, is um, far and away the best in the world. But the children that I know their parents are very creative people. The children themselves have very sort of stimulating environments. And the school that they go, the schools they went to just couldn't, they couldn't answer to that. I mean, they couldn't be as exciting as the home. There was such a lot of potential in these kids and there's so many people around who are not teaching small children. They're working as painters or writers or potters or whatever. And it seemed to me that, that the loss of, of those people and their contact in a formal situation with children was a great, you know, great shame. And I can't bear to see time go by and not see a child's life, those years that are longer really than, than adult years, not used to the absolute optimum. And that's really what the school is like. In this ruralist world, you come across almost anything that you might find in a child's picture book. The inhabitants of Wellow Village are getting used to a few surprises. For the Jubilee celebrations, Jan designed a dragon, and the children of the Looking Glass School took to the streets and the fields. It's a part of the whole ruralist conception to believe that there are few frontiers between childhood and adult life. The curiously comforting thing about the ruralists is that uh, for years I've been called nostalgic and sentimental and all these things which were meant to be insults and suddenly I mean I am all these things and it's fine because that's often what we're painting about anyway I mean I am childish and I am sentimental and it's all right it suddenly occurred to me um, quite recently that what I've always painted have been I think someone called them the, the fringe entertainers you know um, the, the wrestlers, the strippers, um, film stars, where there's a certain amount of fantasy involved. I mean, like, like very young girl film stars like Tuesday Weld. There was a certain group of, of young stars that, in, in a way, it was an extraordinary phenomenon. I think I've always painted this sort of um, twilight world. I mean, this um, the fringe, fringe entertainers. And in a funny sort of way, um, I still am, you know, except now it's the fairies, the gnomes, Titania. They all seem to come vaguely into the same category as well, you know. It's a difficult picture. Um, what I wanted to try and do was, was really feel how a fairy, you know, the queen of the fairies might feel and what she would do. So, so I was sort of trying to invent a morality so that something like the, the daisy plaited into the pubic hair wasn't done in terms of what a mortal would do. I mean, in those terms, it's very vulgar, presumably. Um, whereas, you know, I try to imagine a, you know, a, a female type figure in, in a landscape as we know it. I mean, this is assuming that, that the fairies do exist and that Titania is, is around now. Um, 
and how would she decorate herself? I mean, with no clothes, she might she might steal clothes, I suppose, from that existed. But if she was inventing, what would she do? And that one one concept was that she might well not cover the important parts that the, the, a mortal would cover. So she might well decorate her breasts and and her pubic hair. So this was the main main point. When she's finished, she, she'll look rather different. She'll have um, for instance, she, she has a belt on her waist, um, already around the neck, there's a necklace with things that she's found, but the things that she's found are an old piece of glass and a button, and Liberty found an old spark plug that was very rusted away, and she might well be wearing that. So, I mean, the, the mythology is that she's out there now, I mean, she might well be down by the river or hiding, I mean, I've never seen her, but if they do exist, I mean, she's just as likely to wear you know, badges that I might have lost down there. Graham Arnold paints collages. His images are formed by a process of memory and association around a particular theme. They are mysterious, like dreams. I asked him to explain one of them in detail. The moonlight and the sky took about five or six days, working for about ten hours a day, I think. And the painting as a whole would have taken six or seven months of pretty continuous working on it. And it was the first ruralist painting in which I tried to embody my own ideas concerning ruralism. And the uh, title of the painting I called Memorials of a Quiet Life. I think of memorials as being something to do with memory. There's a mixture of images that float into one's mind of complete things to do with the past and also others which are much more confused and nebulous. So that I wanted in this picture to try and move from clear-cut particular places or particular objects and allow the painting to kind of flow into areas of much greater confusion. Right from the start, I made a list of the qualities that I wanted the painting to have. And on the whole, they were feminine. A, s a certain softness, a certain feeling of silence about the painting, almost. I was trying to make a painting which somehow wasn't just a copy of what one sees, necessarily, but also contained the interests that I personally have books that I liked, instruments that I liked, animals, moths, butterflies, trees, all these kind of things. Four little boxes contain the bark of elm trees, which were taken from the road opposite the house down there with the lawn. And that is, in fact, Garsington Manor which is just outside Oxford, with their house, where in the 20s and 30s, a lot of poets, philosophers and so on, used to go and spend weekends. Virginia Woolf went there, and T.S. Eliot, Bertrand Russell, people that I admired. The cricketer is Ranji, a um, Indian prince, who was playing about the turn of the century. 1900s. I'm very, very fond of cricket. I like painting things which don't normally go together and using things as uh, emphasis in the picture, tensions in the picture. The books in relation to the house are obviously gigantic in size, but you might be confused in thinking, well, perhaps I'm looking past the books out into a landscape so that you create a kind of local space. As you move up to the violin, the space changes again. It, it, it warps about all over the place. I've made the actual shape of the picture, the golden mean rectangle, so that there's no, it's not, in fact, haphazard at all. 
but it does have some kind of order. There are certain people that know immediately what the painting's about. They're not very many, but I do come across them from time to time. I don't think I've ever explained it in the way I've explained it to you, to anybody. I certainly didn't explain it to the person that bought it. David Inshaw paints poetic landscapes inhabited by the romantic figures of girls with long flowing hair. His paintings are remarkable for their beautiful effects of sunlight and shade. The Orchard was his latest and had taken more than a year to complete. As with the other members of the Brotherhood, Inshaw's ideas mature slowly and only surface in his paintings after long periods of reflection. His pictures are filled with finely detailed texture. Their deep and spacious skies reflect into his canvases an air that is pure and crystal clear by day or night. In his studio and devices, he talked to me about a painting that was still unfinished after several years. Well, this is a painting I started about four years ago. Um, I think I started it without having a very clear idea of what I wanted. And as a consequence of that, I've never really ever been happy with it. So I'm the sort of painter that likes to start a picture and carry it right through to a conclusion, bring it to an end. And once it's done, it's done. I like to move on to something else. But with this picture, I've never ever been happy with it, and I've always, at odd times over the last four years, picked it up and fiddled with it, changed it. And two years ago, I put a, a, a figure of a man in here. And I eventually, yesterday, got round to um, start to paint him out. And I'm, happy, I'm quite happy now that he has gone. He's been a kind of shadow hanging over me for the last two years. Um, but just repainting this little piece um, is going to mean that I probably have to repaint the whole picture because I will have to paint the hedge, repaint this hedge, which will lead me on to paint the grass and probably back up into the tree because there are certain things that I'm very unhappy with um, because over the last four years my ideas about painting trees, for instance, has changed quite a lot. My ideas are far less formalised than they used to be. I've understood more about trees and so I think I'd like to repaint the elm tree. Um, although there aren't very many elm trees about, it's going to be difficult to find one in Wiltshire particularly. The painting has gone on like that, little bits of changes here, there and everywhere. So it's never been a complete thought in my mind. I think the sky will change next. I'm very unhappy about the sky, so that will be repainted. In the Bath exhibition, David Inshaw included a figure painting called The Letter. Most English painters are habitually reticent or intellectual when painting naked women. Inshaw paints the nude with frank enthusiasm and delight. David, your painting seems to be changing in transition from landscapes to figure paintings. Would you like to tell me something about that? Yes, over the last four or five years I've been painting landscapes and gardens. And during that time, the figures in the paintings have gradually got smaller and smaller until they, I was frightened that they would disappear altogether. And the figure has always been an important part of the paintings and I wanted in some way to bring them back to be a dominant part of the painting. And um, I thought a, a good way of doing this would be to bring the figures into an interior and use the figures in a large way, a, a, a large figures in the interiors. And also over the, well, for many years now, I've been interested in two particular painters, um, Stanley Spencer and Baltus. And these two painters, I think, have been quite an influence on the way I work and the way I think about painting. And they both use the figure as a dominant uh, element in their paintings. So I decided that I would use two large figures, girls, because I like painting girls, and um, to use them in, a, in an interior. Well, two years ago I went to um, work in Cambridge at Trinity College, and the first night I spent in the college was in the old guest room at the college. And this is a wonderful room, very dark room. The walls are very dark. And there are, there's one window in the, in, the, in the bedroom of the old guest room, set of rooms. and 
it has a view looking out into a courtyard. And the only thing you can see when you look through the window is, um, is, a, is a chestnut tree. And the time I went there, it was in flower. And one was presented with this wonderful picture through the window, completely of the tree. There was nothing else except the tree and the, ca the, the, the flower candles, bright red, on the tree. And this was a wonderful um, experience just to see this. And it, 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 I thought it was possibly the beginning of a painting or the germ of a painting. I chose the girl sitting in the window seat because I liked her haircut. I, I, I just loved the, 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 the shape of her hair when she turned sideways and looked out of the window. And so I asked her if she would pose and she said she would. So that's the reason she's in the painting. Um, for years and years, I don't know where it comes from, but I've always liked blue and white spotted dresses. I, I, I don't know where, it, maybe it comes from childhood, I don't know, but I decided that she should be wearing a blue and white spotted dress. So I, I bought a blue and white spotted dress. I haven't put the spots on yet, they're, they're, they're to come. Um, I wanted the painting to be an erotic painting. I wanted, because there were two girls in this room, this very dark room, I wanted it to have an erotic element to it. So I had Veronica sitting in very many different erotic poses. I took photographs of her and I did some drawings as well. And I started to paint her in this rather erotic pose. And then I decided that I wanted a figure, a large figure in the painting, a life figure. And I wanted to do the life figure because it, I, had, I hadn't done one for a long time. I hadn't done a large life figure for a long time. And I want, it was a challenge to, to, do, to do this, to see if I could do it, especially with the backlighting that you get in this particular room. And when I, um, decide, when I started to sketch the li life figure into the painting, the, the, the figure of Veronica seemed to be too erotic. It, it seemed to have too, too many implications, maybe, maybe of lesbianism, I don't know, but it, it seemed to be wrong. So I decided that Veronica should be just sitting there calmly looking out of the window. And the relationship, the tension between the two figures would be a much more um, mysterious relationship. Whereas before, when, ero when Veronica was in erotic pose, it looked, looked too um, overt. So I decided that she should just be sitting there in a calm way, rather, r rather fitting in with the atmosphere of the view of the tree beyond the window. I've always decided that it, it is nice to paint people that you know. And so in that sense, the paintings of the figures are celebrations of my feelings for the people in the painting. Um, the, the girl on the left is, is um, Vicky, and I've known her for a long time. Um, I've always wanted to paint her, and this seemed to be the right kind of context to paint her in. And she was happy to, to do the posing for the picture, so in she went. Before we, you know, we're going to do this film, I, did, I tried to think what, what my paintings are about, you see, and the, the only thing I could think of, was that I, I just like painting girls and trees, and it's, just, it's fair, almost as simple as that. But, uh, but I was convinced of this, because last week I was, I was drawing a portrait um, of a girl, a friend, in Cambridge. And I was doing this drawing because I've always admired Holbein's drawings and Stanley Spencer's portrait drawings, beautiful. And they're always life-size. And I've never been able to do a life-size drawing. It always end up very small, sight size. I always sit too far away from the model. So I sat very close to Robin, right up close to her, about three feet away. And I spent four days just looking at her. Wonderful it was. It was, a, it was the most beautiful experience, just to spend four days gazing at a girl's face without any feeling of embarrassment. And that, that I, I can't describe the, the, the relationship that builds up in, the, in that understanding of another person and trying to fix the feelings that you have and things that you see. And I, that's probably why I like to paint girls. Since Christmas. It's really odd. On Midsummer's Day, the Brotherhood and friends gathered in a wild garden beneath the walls of Devizes Castle. The time had come for the Feast of the Solstice. It was the Arnold's turn to do the honours. The Blakes came over from Wellow, and the Ovendons travelled up from Cornwall for the occasion. A new ruralist enterprise came under discussion. Each artist, it was decided, should paint their version of Ophelia as a homage to Shakespeare, to Millet, and to beautiful girls. What did Shakespeare say? I mean, what did he, does he say anything about the stream? Does he say it's rough or...? He says it's muddy. Muddy, mm. yeah. Muddy. To a muddy death, isn't it, or something like that? Mm. Well, the ball is She floats muddy, on the stream, supported for a little while mm. by her dress, 
and buy all the flowers and so on, and then gradually... Does she fall in or walk in? I think she walks in. No, 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 she actually... Isn't it an envious slither broke or something like that? I think she actually slides in, doesn't she? Like one would on the bank of a stream. Millet's painting of Lizzie Siddle, in fact, doesn't look really like Rossetti's drawings of Lizzie at all. She's a much more sort of Victorian vulturous sort of lady in Millet's painting of her. Mm. I think so, mm. rather than that rather frail, fragile quality which the Rossetti drawings sort of so admirably put across. So what do you, what age she do you looks see? about 30 there. Yeah. Whereas... No, how old was Lizzie Siddle when he painted it? Must have been more in her twenties. Yes, I think Twenty-five, I think. Twenty-five. Yeah. Twenty-five. Uh, I, I see her being about, about fourteen years old <laughs> and being slightly, slightly crazed. Very crazed. Yes, yeah. having having a certain kind of look in her eye, which. Um, well, I, I've I've started doing her, having torn all her clothes off. She's so crazed, and walking in holding a sort of bunch of. Of mad wild flowers, you know, which, which which is in these stories. Yes. Yeah, that makes yes. sure you get the right watercolor yeah. painting by Richard Dad called Mad Margaret. Yes, that's, that's, that's yes. Yeah. That, that has always been a very yeah. very close to my idea of Ophelia. Yeah, terrific painting. Yeah. There's a girl in Devise's library that fits exactly my idea, of Ophelia. <laughs> and um, I don't like to go up to her and say. Would you mind being? Um, well, if you go with Anne, that's all right. You go if you go together. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should ask her. You've got the right sort of crazed look. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfair, isn't it? No, she is very, very beautiful as well, but she has got that certain strangeness, mm. which is just right. I don't know how long it took Millet to paint his Ophelia, but I'm sure the ruralists will take longer. Millet painted his picture on the banks of a stream in Surrey. A few days after the feast, David Inshaw joined Graham Ovenden in Cornwall. Both artists agreed to share the same model. This Cornish setting was one that Millet might have chosen himself. Graham Ovenden is a determined idealist, a nutter, who likes doing things for himself. Barley Splat, his home, is a bold declaration of independence. It's a celebration of the unity of the arts and crafts. He hopes it may revive the ideas that William Morris and the Pre-Raphaelites began more than a century ago. I think building Barley Splat is rather like painting a picture to me. It's something that one must do. Uh, and one can't totally an analyse all the reasons why. But. Um, so I think about house building, this is sort of where, in fact, with a few notable exceptions, architecture has totally divorced itself from the applied arts because it was not the exception by any means for, in fact, a great house to be totally designed, not only in terms of the actual architecture, but all the fittings, the furniture, the fabrics. I mean, this is such a marvellous thing, and this is, of course, in fact, where the pre-Raphaelite image, the, the, the William Burgess, works so well. There's a complete unity. There's no reason why this shouldn't still exist. I think we've collectively had dreams of a of a second Gothic revival, which sounds perhaps the layman a little bizarre, but in fact, if one really sits down and analyzes it, I think it's a very, very practical proposition. I think at Barley Spec, one is proving the fact that it's eminently possible.
just as Graham Ovenden had to paint on the piano, so his wife, Annie, made do with the kitchen table. She wanted to finish a portrait of their son, Edmund, in time to show the picture at the Edinburgh Festival. <laughs> Sometimes, when, when you've got an idea for a painting, you know, you, you really want to get on with it, and you can't because uh, the baby's crying, or, or Edmund wants his tea or something, then, then it, uh, it is a bit difficult, but uh, I've learned to live with that now. Edmund certainly, I think, is, is definitely going to be very artistic. He has a, uh, an amazing sense of three dimension. You know, he, he's, he can pick up Lego or anything and turn it into marvellous buildings. And he's, he's able to concentrate quite well on when he's painting. It's the first portrait I've done for hmm, 10 years or so, I suppose. And uh, he's holding a little tree that he's grown himself which he loves very much. And, uh, and it was just really fun enough that the pot that he planted the tree in has the word sunshine on it, which is, the, I've always called him Sunshine, it's just his nickname. So that's really why, he's, why that's in the painting. It's all gone to my head, you see, this bath show. And <laughs> so I thought, if I can't do Edmund's portrait, then I wouldn't be able to do anybody else's. Like many other members of the Brotherhood, Graham Ovenden is an erudite and passionate collector. His 19th century photographs are outstanding. He owns prints by all the masters. The subjects he prefers are almost always children his most prized possession is a Lewis Carroll photograph of Alice Liddell, the girl child who inspired Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. Ruralist painting is a bit of a challenge to anyone who grew up, as I did, with modern art. It is less conventional than I had expected, but some people think that this return to Victorian and pre-Raphaelite interests is irrelevant in this day and age. To make up my own mind about this, I joined the Brotherhood again later in the year, in another part of Cornwall. It was now October, and an Indian summer. Each year, for three years now, the group have shared a painting holiday on the North Cornish coast, near Bude. It's become a part of the ruralist calendar. If ever there were a place made for painting, this was it. They were staying in a group of cottages, set in apple orchards and surrounded by dense woods and fertile hills, all within sight and sound of the sea. The woods and streams were alive with children from the Looking Glass School. It was an unbelievably Arcadian place. It seemed to me that the distance between London and these scenes in Cornwall symbolised the gulf between artists and their critics, the distance between the makers of pictures and the makers of reputations.
The meanest thing a critic can do, Jan Howarth told me, is to say of a painting, oh, it's merely beautiful. I suppose there are good reasons for painting blank canvases that invite blank reviews, for collecting bricks as examples of minimal art. Performance groups can solemnly pour buckets of water over each other, vomit down drains, bury themselves in deep holes in the ground, and do as they like for all I care. Perhaps it was possible, I thought, to believe in all that, living in a modern city. But not down here, not in this place with these people. The ruralists are accused of being nostalgic. For my part, nostalgia in its correct meaning is not the word to use. The Brotherhood are aware of the past, but they're not living in it, nor are the escapists. But there is something inside themselves which they're determined not to let escape. What they have held on to is everything that makes childhood such a vivid experience. The child in all of us is indestructible, but too often, in becoming adult, we repress our childishness and lose the capacity to wonder at the beauty of the world. We no longer respond to magic or imagination. We no longer know how to play. I think that painters, poets, being creative people, avoid this shriveling of childish perception and imagination. The ruralists, as I saw them, knew how to share with children all the things that children love. Like children, they see the world with an innocent eye. Like Cezanne, they can speak of art with simplicity saying that painting is no more than the means of making the public feel what they, as artists, have felt themselves. In our own confused times, I believe that we are still looking for a convincing culture. The Brotherhood seem to know which way they want to go, and their feelings do have something to say about the way we all live. <laughs> 